Tonight in our third panel, the Holodomor in international context, uh, with Brega Marsh, Olaf Natu, Christina Hook, and Marnie Howlett as a discussant. So over to you, Ray. Good afternoon. In his new book, Oceans of Grain, How American Wheat Changed the World, historian Scott Reynolds Nelson argues that wheat technology and railroads played significant roles in shaping economic and social changes throughout history. Uh, the book was published in uh, May of, of this year, after I was, I would say, two thirds of the way done my paper. And so I had to backtrack because I want I, you know, it was like something had fallen into my lap that I could could not and did not want to avoid. And, and so uh, I read his book and it, it really uh, directed a lot of uh, the way I approached this this topic. Um, I've been researching the Hall of Demore for about 12 years now. And uh, I started out thanks to uh, really Cambridge University Library's exhibition of Gareth Jones's uh, notebooks in 2009. And, and so uh, to, the more I've, I've looked into the topic, you know, the more threads you begin to, to pull out. And um, when, when I re started reading Reynolds' uh, book, you realize how, just how important the whole idea of, of wheat is, okay? And, and what's, the, what's at the heart of, of my paper is what I call the conjuncture uh, of two really disparate elements. Right, we have at this time the largest surplus of grain that humanity had ever seen. For the first time in history, uh, there was more grain available and being produced uh, than could be consumed. And on the other hand, you have you know approximately four million Ukrainians. Uh, starving to death, and so how do you reconcile that, and 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 how does it affect the way we see the Hall of Demore? and that's really what uh, this paper uh, uh, attempts to get at, and and so I I talk about conjuncture here as the combination of circumstances or fears, especially at a crucial time, and so. Um, that's really what, what drove my research. A brief outline. The first part, it's called the calamity of good crops. And, and again, uh, this, this really occurred starting in 1928, exacerbated in 1930 by the Soviets dumping what, what, what the, the West, Western uh, journalists called dumping of, of wheat onto an already fully saturated market. And so what happened starting in 1930 was a precipitous fall in the price of wheat everywhere in the world, basically. And countries started becoming very concerned Right? You hear about the, the Great Depression in, in Western countries. Bread lines, right? That's the image we, we, we have. Unemployment. And yet, the amount of grain that was unused and just 
sitting was greater than it had ever been. And, and nobody knew what to do with it. And so the more I started reading about that, well, how, you know, it's hard when you're, you're thinking about mass starvation on the scale that we, we know happened, and yet there is so much grain and wheat available that they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to stop the, the price from falling even further. And it was ruining economies. And, and so uh, Nelson's book only goes until 1924 with the, with the death of his main source of information, uh, a, a, a German by the name of Alexander Israel Helpman, who died in 1924. And, and he was, a, he was a, a German grain trader and revolutionary who wrote under the pseudonym of Parvis. But uh, Nelson really explores the ways in which the growing of wheat, its recipes for salvage and transportation, its distribution lines, and the intangibles that made trade possible uh, bound producers and consumers together, quote, in a common world ecology that viruses, empires, and states have only ridden upon bits of foam on a vast invisible deep. And so, that's, I wanted to take Nelson's thesis and apply it uh, to what was happening in, in, in 31, 32, 33, with the culmination of the London Wheat Agreement, um, which was, was signed in August of 1933 by many of the, you know, the largest uh, grain producing nations in, in the world including the Soviet Union. So the wheat crisis was really what it was called in the, in the press. And let me just read you one thing that an agricultural expert uh, noted. And, and he believed that, that countries were struggling because of what happened after the First World War, the, the, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, and, and what that did to trade and what it did to Germany's economy. And, and he said, without due respect, that, that the Treaty of Versailles was written, quote, without due respect for history, geography, and justice, and without regard for the potentialities inherent in some nations. Their provisions could not fail to breed a series of evil consequences, one rising inevitably from the other. This has necessarily led to general rearmament. Armaments constitute a danger of war. The danger of war provokes self-defense. Self-defense implies self-sufficiency. And self-sufficiency means buying at home and not from abroad. And it was this vicious cycle that you see uh, in, in news reports covering the wheat crisis and the, the, this, the many conferences held in 1931, 1932, and 1933, le leading to the agreement in 1933. So um, that's what I deal with in, in the first part. So in 1932, after they, you know, by, by the end of 1931, after three conferences in a matter of nine months, they still could not come to, to an agreement in terms of how to stop, number one, the price of wheat from falling, how to get rid of existing stocks. And you start to see suggestions in news reports that this excess wheat should go to people who have, you know, who, who are starving. And I just found that uh, quite, quite amazing that already there were movements that we need to do something to alleviate the suffering of, of people who are hungry. 
And so hearing this morning all the, 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 the several papers dealing with international relief is something that, that you know, I've been involved with in, in my research, Cardinal in, Initzer and the others, but also I learned a lot today in terms of uh, the movements in, in several European countries uh, organizing, you know, relief efforts. But Initzer kind of stole the spotlight, so to, so to speak, in, in August of 1933 when he cabled, number one, the U.S. State Department and held a press conference uh, calling upon the International uh, Red Cross uh, to do something about conditions in, in uh, Ukraine. So in 1932, uh, which I deal with in, in, the, in this part, um, Great Britain was, was the first country to start imposing 100% uh, tariffs on, on grain. And 90 countries followed suit. And what happens when uh, it, you know, tariffs become excessive? Well, right, international trade come, comes to a halt. And that's exactly what happened in, in 1932. Uh, many of the nations became very protective. Uh, and, and of course, that did not solve the problem either. And um, I, I might add that in 1931, it was the journalist, uh, Lewis Fisher, for, for the Nation magazine, who suggested that wheat might be the way for the US and, and, and the Soviet Union to uh, find you know, rapprochement. And of course, he, he was an ardent uh, defender of, of Stalin. Let me just continue with uh, one of the points I make here about the Dawes plan, uh, which was part of, of what was imposed on, on Germany. Um, the Treaty of Versailles had created economic disparities that made it increasingly difficult for countries to pay their debt. As asserted in the Dawes plan in 1924, payments of reparations by Germany could be made by bringing about a rest restoration of German prosperity, particularly in terms of foreign trade. The funds transferred to the allies on reparations account cannot in the long run exceed the sums which the balance of payment makes it possible to transfer. That was the basis of, of the Dawes plan. Uh, more ominously, young Germans were beginning to rebel against reparations, uh, as well as the war guilt accusation, a term coined by former British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and after years of depri deprivation, many believe, quote, that the scheme of reparations deprives the German of opportunity to enjoy life and to attain progress. That feeling is the basis for Hitlerism. And so uh, that economic theory uh, plays an important part as we move forward. Recognize Russia Now was the title of an article that Fisher wrote uh, in, in 1933. And what's really interesting is that at the end of 1932, uh, Fisher was highly critical of, of, of the Soviets for their grain requisition campaign. And that, that kind of surprised me because he remained a, a staunch Stalinist. Nothing could change his, his mind. And uh, yet when I read what he wrote about grain requisition, it, it, really, it really hit home because I would not have expected that from him. And yet, his reporting at that time 
was was I would argue some of the 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 most critical of the 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 grain requisition plan for you know late 1932 or early 1933. Of course, uh, grain requisition ended on January 15, which is the beginning of the worst period of mass starvation in, in Ukraine. The end of 1932 also marked the uh, election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president of the United States. And uh, in the earlier session, we, we heard uh, about the ARA, uh, which Hoover had, had spearheaded, and, and the Soviets hated Hoover. He, even though he had run a concession in, in, in the country uh, years before that. Uh, what he, and what he did, saving lives, helping to save lives uh, through the uh, Relief Association, ARA, um, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't give an inch in, in terms of, uh, of recognition. And, and no American business uh, had, had government support in, in terms of, of attempting to do business with the Soviet Union. It doesn't mean that businesses didn't work with the Soviets. They certainly, American businesses didn't work with the Soviets. They certainly did, but they had no government support. And so Roosevelt really wanted to change that. And I argue that this drive for recognition uh, really displaced starting in March when when Roosevelt took office, uh, it, it it literally buried the story of, of the famine that was that was being, again, highly publicized in, in Western newspapers. In the last section, I, I deal with the idea of international relief and, and how that, that came about. And um, presenters this morning did, did an excellent job, so I don't, I don't need to go a lot into that. I will say a couple of things, though. One, it's really interesting to read uh, the, the Nazis' take on uh, what was happening, uh, specifically in, re in regards to re relief. The, the, the uh, general consul stationed in Kharkiv very much supported the, uh, the idea that, that more, that the German government wasn't doing enough uh, to, to help relieve the situation for the German Mennonites. But the German ambassador to the Soviet Union shut that down completely, shut down uh, what Bruder and not was 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 attempting to do, and so no relief w was given uh, to the to the German colonists uh, still in in the Soviet Union. I also argue that, that the push for recognition uh, really trumped recognition of, of the famine. And in, in the press, uh, you, you, it's really when what I call the third level of denial of, of the famine takes place. And, and uh, Durante, was was certainly a, a part of that, uh, talking about recogni you know, re recognition of the Soviet Union being, you know, or or talk about famine being, right, an eleventh hour uh, attempt to forestall the U.S. recognizing the Soviet Union, and so it's it's it's, it's certainly uh, tied to that. I came across in State Department records, uh, information from uh, a, a member 
of, of a delegation stationed in Moscow. And here's what he had to say about why international relief was never going to be allowed in, in the Soviet Union. He said, the policy of collectivization was too closely associated with the name of Stalin for an open admission of its failure to be made without grave injury to his prestige as leader of the, the Communist Party. Hmm. And it's at this point that you really begin to see any reporting of, of mass starvation as really not Nazi propaganda. It was really weaponized at, at, at this point. The, the Nazi threat made FDR's recognition of the Soviet Union more palatable to his critics in the US. And linking stories of, of the famine with Nazi propaganda became the predominant message for denial. Durante unabashedly pointed out that famine stories in Berlin, Riga, and Vienna, quote, were making an 11th hour attempt to avert American recognition by picturing the Soviet Union as a land of ruin and despair. The significance to me of, of the Wheat Agreement of 1933 emanates from its interrelationship with financial and political events that rever reverberate around the Hall of Damore. As one agricultural expert noted at the time, quote, one must have a clear impression of the international actions and reactions of agricultural production on finance and of finance on agricultural production in order to understand at what point it is utopian to try to treat the wheat crisis as an exclusively agricultural and commercial problem and when it should be regarded as a national problem." Unquote. That's it. Hello, uh, and uh, I would like to, to thank, to thank uh, uh, organizers for inviting me for the conference. And uh, I remember that uh, the main uh, slogan or name of the conference is uh, framing, uh, framing Holodomor in a global context. Uh, and I will try to do it uh, in my paper. But uh, 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 I, uh, I would like to uh, present you something uh, else uh, at, at the beginning of my presentation. Um, because I, I think that uh, we need also to build uh, bridges between uh, this history and contemporary situation. And uh, I would like to present you uh, a little thing to show you. Uh, it is uh, a symbolic uh, blue and yellow little uh, brush. Um, wheat in Ukrainian uh, colors. Uh, and uh, uh, my friend uh, presented me this, this gift this year in July 2022 when Ukrainian fields were burned. burned uh, and wheat uh, was uh, dis uh, 
field were fields were destroyed and uh, and wheat uh, also and uh, new danger of um, famine of uh, starvation appeared as a as a global as a global danger again so speaking about again never again it we are now in a different situation than one year ago and uh, my paper serves as a prolegomenon on uh, and as a kind of continuation of the presented uh, the one uh, was uh, presented three years ago at the Edmonton conference and uh, then, uh, then together with Miroslav Czech I presented the following uh, research postulate uh, it is necessary to restore the memory of those who provide this assistance not only to give recognition to those who showed humanity at a difficult time and preserve their memory the point is also that Relief efforts offers a practical alternative to the politics of the day with uh, uh, their imperialism, uh, stick and totalitarian ideologies covered up by clamorous uh, slogans about social progress and uh, universal class or racial happiness. End of quotation. It is surprising, but apart from a few uh, articles dedicated to the activities of the Lviv-based Ukrainian Civic Committee to Save Ukraine, little is known about the, uh, the activities of Ukrainian aid uh, committees, uh, committees in Belgium, uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia, the France, Great Britain, Germany, Romania, Poland, uh, and uh, uh, even less about non-Ukrainian efforts in various countries. Uh, you can uh, you can see here on the map uh, that uh, almost every uh, in, almost in every uh, European country there were uh, committees, and uh, we uh, actually. Mm, don't know um, uh, whether they were committees in Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Lithuania, Latvia, uh, and Italy. Uh, but uh, on the uh, on the uh, League of Nations sources, I, I can I can uh, I can prove that uh, other other. European countries uh, have such committees and uh, more. Also, in for for sure in Canada, in the US, it is obvious, but uh, surprisingly also in China. So it is it is really uh, really uh, strange and uh, um, but China, I mean China, but also Turkey. Uh, is uh, a little bit surprising, uh, but but uh, we remember that uh, that uh, uh, at the beginning of twenties, uh, uh, Ukrainian delegation uh, was in Turkey, and Turkey was a really important partner for uh, for Ukrainians because of the of the geographical. Uh, 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 geographical uh, situation. Um, so uh, these committees played a significant role in informing European public opinion about the famine in Ukraine, its scale, causes, and consequences. There is also no doubt that uh, these activities had significant influence in changing Stalin's policy towards the peasants in Ukraine. For the Soviets, very, uh, the reaction of Ukrainians throughout the war to the Holodomor presented a serious challenge. Thanks to publications of uh, documents from Soviet archives, now we know how concerned they were and what measures they were taking to counteract it, especially by pressure on Poland to forbid the activity 
of relief committees. Um, Um, here are listed some uh, little known uh, committees uh, and uh, not all of them, but some of them I, I was able, I was able to, to find. Despite uh, an extensive aid campaign of the goal of providing mass aid to the starving and stopping the criminal Soviet policy, wasn't achieved. The reasons for this have already been discussed. So I will only recall two the two most important ones. Uh, first, the consistent uh, denial of the famine by the Soviet authorities, uh, which entailed a refusal to, uh, to accept aid. And second, the lack of strong reaction from uh, the Entente uh, uh, states. Two strategies were possible under these circumstances, political one and humanitarian. The first, that of applying political and economic pressure on the Soviet authorities was advocated by, among others, uh, Ewald Amende, president of the European Minority Congress. But no country gained the courage to put pressure on the USSR, and uh, my previous uh, previous speaker uh, uh, just uh, um, presented one of the one of the reasons. And uh, um, no country gained the courage to put pressure on the USSR, even though the victims of the famine were not only Ukrainians, but also tens of thousands of Poles, Germans, Moldovans, and Romanians, as well as Jews. Remaining silent or even denying the catastrophic famine of the Ukrainian people was the policy of, uh, of European states, regardless of their prevailing social order. Democratic, authoritarian, and totalitarian countries alike kept silent about the genocide of Ukrainians. They did so for a variety of reasons, but maintaining good relations with the Soviets was always the motive. Uh, the second relief strategy, the provision of uh, Soviet licensed aid, remained merely palliative. The Soviet authorities applied the principle of centralization and so had the full control over the type, scale, scale and uh, recipients and, uh, of aid. Uh, in other words, uh, the currency so needed by uh, the Soviet authorities was coming in and at the same time, the suspicious element uh, I mean, uh, people with relatives or acquaintance abroad was being uh, identified. Uh, in uh, the mid of thirties, it became a pretext of, for a subsequent repressive measures uh, against national groups. Uh, once the Kremlin declared that assistance itself constituted evidence of contra-revolutionary and espionage activity of given national group. One example was, was uh, German. Uh, as the first strategy of consolidated political pressure, which would have been the most effective, proved uh, unrealistic, uh, the second remained, uh, which was based on the power of the powerless or civil society. The Ukrainian and international committees did their best to provide aid uh, to the starving and to inform the public opinion about the famine. The areas of activity of the relief committees can be divided as follows. Collecting donation, donations and grain. Uh, this action was in East Galicia uh, and Canada. 
Second, pu publications in the local and national press in various countries. Uh, third, uh, reaching out to opinion it's leaders, terrible. prominent uh, oh. politicians. Four, cooperation with national and international relief organizations. Uh, five, combining efforts with other committees, broader in not Jewish and Mennonite uh, organizations or uh, Save the Children. And uh, six, and it is last but not least, uh, activities addressed to international organizations, in particular the Congress of National Minorities, the League of Nations, and the Red Cross. Uh, the list is long and uh, worth of carefully uh, examining. The description and analysis of all these directions is a task for a whole team of researchers. Uh, in uh, my contribution, I will focus only on the last one, uh, and uh, I will do uh, so selectively, uh, limited uh, myself to the Congress of National Minorities, League of Nations, and Red, uh, Red uh, Cross. And, uh, uh, and I will start with, uh, with Congress of European Minorities. Uh, when analyzing the appeals to international organizations, it is important to have in mind uh, not only the context of international politics, but also the specific formula that prevailed uh, where the emphasis was on the humanitarian aspect of the assistance uh, and all political, uh, political connotation must be avoided. However, there is no doubt that the authors of these appeals were aware of the genocide, uh, genocidal uh, nature of the Holodomor and the aims of Soviet policy. Already in the first communique of the uh, UNDO Central Committee issued on um, June uh, 24th, 1933, we come across a statement. The robbery policy of the communists in Ukraine aims at physical and moral destruction of the Ukrainian people. End of quotation. In all pamphlets that the Ukrainian aid committees issued, evidence was presented not only on the artificial nature of the famine, but also of the Soviet policy objective of taming the rebellious Ukraine. Vasil Mudry, mentioned today uh, by uh, Karolina from Civic Relief uh, Committee for, for Starving Soviet Ukraine in, uh, in his pamphlet, Lecholitia Ukraine claimed, uh, quotation, the Bolshevik dictatorship in Moscow was using all possible means to enslave Ukraine as much as possible, in particular to eliminate the Ukrainian national question within the USSR. Hlib Lazarevsky, a prominent Ukrainian activist who in the 30s was an associate of the Ukrainian Scientific Institute in Warsaw, stayed in a pamphlet published in Polish. Quotation, after gaining power, the Moscow Bolsheviks couldn't, quite obviously, come to terms with Ukraine, Ukraine's desire for independence. Russia, no matter whether white or red, couldn't abandon its granary voluntarily. A cruel and unequal struggle began, and it lasts until today. Maybe until today, not today in 1933, uh, when, uh, 1934, when this pamphlet was published. And uh, one more uh, of the, uh, of the, um, uh, brochure or a pamphlet, Olger Buczkowski, uh, who prepared uh, uh, famine in Ukraine. Uh, he presented the problem in the most systematic way analyzing available sources and casualties uh, statistics, the attitude of the Soviet authorities and world opinion towards the famine, and outlining Ukrainian and international relief efforts. His conclusions were devastating. Quotation, the world 
He asserted after a uh, thorough uh, enumeration of publications about uh, the Holodomor in the World Press was not badly informed about the catastrophic famine in the land of Soviets. It is another matter that it didn't react actively to this disaster. Uh, disaster. It didn't give actual assistance to the population dying in mass on that side of the Soviet border. End of quotation. Now let's look uh, at the activity of three international organizations, namely the Congress of National Minorities, the League of Nations, and Red Cross. Uh, or more precisely, on prompting them to act. Chronologically, the first was the uh, Ninth Congress of European Minorities, held in Bern, uh, September, uh, mid of September uh, 1933. However, the Ukrainian success at this Congress wouldn't uh, have uh, be possible if Viennese Cardinal Theodor Initzer moved by the letter from Archbishop Andrei Sheptitsky hadn't published an appeal for immediate relief for people starving in Ukraine before the Congress. The appeal was reprinted in many newspapers in Europe and in America, and also in Vatican's uh, official newspaper, Osservatore Romano. Almost simultaneously, a letter from Ewald Amende, the General Secretary of the Congress of European Minorities, was published in at Vienna influential newspaper Reich, uh, Reich Post. Uh, it was uh, June, uh, June 1933. Uh, Amanda called uh, for the immediate launch of an, an apolitical and transdenomination relief effort. During next months, based on the uh, Vienna Relief Committee inter uh, interconfessional and transnational re uh, relief organization of this eminence, uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna has been established, uh, which is uh, the most known international relief committee. The Constituent Assembly was held October uh, 16 uh, in Vienna. Vice President of Austrian Red Cross, uh, uh, Mitter Nyapar uh, became a honorary head of the committee and Eval Amende became honor honorary secretary. In the mid of December, Cardinal Initzer Committee organized the first international conference, which gather, uh, gathered uh, representations of an, uh, 10 nationalities suffered from the famine. Ewald Amende was a key figure uh, who, through his contacts, enabled the Ukrainian delegation in uh, Geneva to meet with the president of the League of Nations, uh, Johann Movinkel. Uh, Mende activity uh, was of great Soviet concern. And uh, I uh, can prove it, uh, but uh, it is enough to remember that uh, the circumstances of his death in 1936, uh, just after publishing uh, uh, life, uh, Human Life in Russia, um, in the US, uh, he, was, uh, he was probably killed but it is uh, it is impossible to to prove uh, amanda has remained uh, remained until his death spiritus moments of different activities of inter uh, confessional committee the author of the appeals addressed to the league of nations and international red cross and uh, during um during uh, the uh, uh, Ninth Congress of European Minorities in uh, Bern, Ukrainian delegation appealed to the President of Congress and all delegations. One of the executive committee members of the Congress was Dmytro Levitsky, uh, the head of the Ukrainian National Democratic Union. And uh, the other uh, was Professor Kurczynski from, uh, from Estonia, uh, and uh, a renowned uh, UNDO politician Milena Rudnitska, member of Ukrainian delegation in her speech delivered at the Congress, revealed uh, the origins of the famine, quotation. This is the policy of Russian red imperialism, which is deliberately and systematically heading towards the physical annihilation 
of the Ukrainian people. Rudnitska, end of quotation, Rudnitska called a spade a spade, uh, another quotation. We must also have the courage to speak clearly about one more matter, about the incredible, incredible unprecedented attitude of the official world politicians to the famine and terror in Ukraine. Right now, we are witnessing the signing of pacts of friendship and non-aggression and trade treaties, the subject of which is this bloody Ukrainian harvest. Responsible statesmen turn a blind eye to what is happening there and claim that they cannot interfere in the internal affairs of another state. The end of quotation. Rudnitska also denounced the staging involving Edouard Herriot. Uh, his journey uh, to USSR happened on the turn of August and September 1933, just two weeks before the Congress in Bayern. And uh, she named him uh, Tavarish uh, Kamandir, Comrade Kamandir. Uh, also, the member of the Executive Committee of the Congress, Professor Kuczynski from Estonia, made a powerful speech. As a result, the famine in Ukraine was the key point in the resolution of the uh, Ninth Congress. The participation of Ukrainian uh, delegation, including Milena Rudnitz, Kazanovi, Polanski, Yuri, Serbeniuk, uh, Volodymyr, Zalozetsky in the Ninth uh, Congress, have resulted in the internationalization of aid efforts. Immediately after this Congress, Serbenyuk and Zalozetsky, on the invitation of Jakob uh, Yakiv Makohin, the founder of Ukrainian Bureau at London, went to London and have met with British officials. They argued to establish British Relief Committee. At the end of September, Serbenyuk and Zalozetsky, together with representatives of Ukrainian Bureau, Cecil uh, Malone and Volodymyr Kisilevsky, have met with the Save the Children Fund, Federation of Jewish Relief Organization, and Quaker Society of Friends. Later, they met with Lawrence Collier, the head of North Department at Foreign Office. At the same time that Serbenyuk and uh, Zalozetsky went to London, the two other delegates, uh, Rudnitska and Polanski, made their way uh, from Bern to Geneva. And uh, at the end of September 1933, Milena Rudnitska, together with Zenovi Polanski, arrived there. Rudnitska made all efforts to place hunger in Ukraine uh, on the agenda of the upcoming uh, meeting assembly. Her efforts were supported by a uh, joint committee of international women uh, organization and its head, Corbett Ashby. Uh, Norwegian uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Johan Movinka, then president of, uh, of League of Nations, received tens of letters and telegrams from Ukrainian relief committees, as well as from Ukrainian People's Republic Minister of Foreign Affairs in exile, Alexander Shulhin. Also, other international organizations have sent telegrams and letters, uh, and also private persons, uh, private uh, and all forms of, of uh, uh, literature. Movinka literally bombarded the Secretary General of the League. Uh, the, matter, uh, the matter was finally dealt with in a close meeting uh, on uh, uh, 29th uh, September 1933, where the fact of the famine was de facto confirmed. But it was considered that as the USSR wasn't a member of the League, the matter should be referred to the International Red Cross. And here is the copy of this letter. Uh, and uh, International Red Cross. Uh, Movinko didn't stop his activity after this decision. Even after stepping down as president of the League of Nations, Movinko, as Norway uh, prime minister, was still lobbying president of International Red Cross, Max Huber, to deal with uh, famine relief. The Euro European Federation of Ukrainians abroad asked the president of the International Red Cross to help the starving population in Ukraine. Uh, 
from Andreevsky's letter dated uh, on uh, September 16, 1933, we learn that an attempt was being made in exile to establish a Ukrainian Red Cross and at the same time, again, financial support for those in need. The Foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs in exile, Oleksandr Shulhin, appealed to the President of uh, Red Cross, Max Huber, to provide aid uh, to the starving population of Ukraine. These letters were formally answered, refusing both the creation of uh, Ukrainian Red Cross due to the anticipated lack of consent uh, from the uh, Soviet government, as well as uh, an organized relief effort. No less formal correspondence was conducted uh, with Red Cross representatives in uh, Austria, Switzerland, and other international organizations. Um, so the uh, Red Cross was only ready to accept funds and send them to the address indicated, which is, as we know, was possible through Turkcin. Uh, those not only uh, that uh, the Red Cross didn't give aid, but also indirectly uh, with injections of currency, it's, it strengthened the Soviet authorities. And um, one of the reasons for not providing aid was probably the fact that the action uh, was started by the German state organization, Ruder Not, which provided aid only to Germans in the USSR. And uh, just quick conclusions. The scale of activity of the Ukrainian and international aid committees was enormous. It led to the consolidation of Ukrainian public opinion outside Soviet Ukraine and to closer cooperation with several international organizations and a number of prominent activists and some prominent politicians. To mention Viennese Cardinal uh, Theodor Initzer, uh, Johann Mowinkel, uh, Ewald Amende, uh, and uh, British politicians and opinion makers. However, with few exception, exceptions of international organizations set up to protect peace and to help victims of disaster or persecution, have used very, uh, every pretext to refuse assistance. Uh, thank you for your atten attention and patience. And uh, just uh, some of sources I have used for uh, preparing my paper. Thank you. Good afternoon. So I am the final speaker on the panel after lunch. So what I can promise you is that there will be the reward of coffee shortly after I finish speaking. Um, and I did want to thank John and Daria for gathering us all today. I've noticed so much thematic synergy of what we're working on. Um, one of the events that my talk will address was in the wonderful collection of pictures that Carolina showed us. So I know that we have a lot to discuss at times like our coffee breaks. Um, and thank you, John and Daria, for convening us together. Now, we've just had two really rich presentations on the 1930s dynamics that were happening internationally. I'm zooming us forward by no less than half a century. Um, my talk really centers on the 1980s, on some dynamics that were happening there. Because as many of us in this room know, the Holodomor was never one of the um, topics that was formally accepted to be discussed during the Soviet Union, even during periods when other dark topics were somewhat coming through. And so um, in my talk, I'm, I'm talking about how this topic came about, um, both things that were happening in North America and reverberations that were happening in Soviet Ukraine. Um, so I wanted to give just a little bit of an orientation about how I come at this project. I'm an anthropologist. I'm a comparative genocide scholar by training. And um, so this work that I'm presenting today is connected to my larger doctoral dissertation that I defended in 2020. It's going to be a book, knock on wood, very soon. 
Um, and so in that work, I, I went to Ukraine um, for the past seven years I've been conducting this multi-year ethnography, really trying to speak with modern Ukrainians today about the legacy of Holodomor, and really interested in speaking with four categories of actors. So I speak with politicians, lawyers, activists, and academics. And what do those groups have in common? They, they work to change and to shape and to inform public opinion. And they also deal with this topic of genocide in very different ways. So commemoration is very different than legal prosecution, which is very different from research um, and all types of things. So I wanted to just orient that because it does play a role in my paper. Um, and so I talk about in this paper about how the Holodomor story slowly emerged during this final decade. And I draw from these interviews with um, these primary sources and from historical documentation. I'm really indebted to specifically individual historians in the room and to the discipline of history writ large and to other types of data that I collected by being in both public events with these figures and private events. And specifically, this chapter in my dissertation, which I began writing in 2018, came about through a Kiev conversation with a member of my dissertation committee at the time. Um, he's the historian, Serhii Plohi, at Harvard. And he was saying, you know, we had just come from the 85th anniversary of the Holodomor. There was a big conference. There were really um, impactful commercials that were happening about the Holodomor that were sponsored by the Ukrainian government. And he said, you know, you're talking with all of these people who were active in that last decade of the Soviet Union. And he said, it's really interesting to me that, that this is such an important story um, for, for people because he said, you know, if we had, we had sort of more positive, maybe even triumphal narratives that we could have shared after the burst of, of people wanting to leave the Soviet Union, we could have drawn from the Cossack heritage, or even if we'd wanted to use kind of maybe a suffering narrative, Chernobyl was so much more recent in time and it impacted so many people. So he said, when you're talking with these people, ask them, ask them about that final decade of the Soviet Soviet Union when they were first exposed to the Holodomor. So that's what led to, to this work. Um, and I, I found really that there was this kind of um, relationship happening, that there were things happening, um, both at the grassroots, and I think, Caroline, I just mentioned your presentation. You talk so nicely about some of the grassroots efforts. I was looking at it through just the, the type of actors that I study. I was looking at people trying to influence the US and even the Canadian political system in some way. Um, and so what I found is that there were a few events in the U.S. system that were happening in the 1980s. There were notable partnerships with American Jewish groups. So again, some, more, some interesting themes happening today is a Canadian scholarly conference and, of course, the U.S. Congressional Commission, with which many of us are familiar with. And so while this global advocacy was happening, this ended up in the retelling and the oral storytelling that I did is kind of necessitating a response from the Soviet Union in ways that I'll discuss. So um, eventually what kind of happened is, to give you the sort of bottom line of this presentation before I go into specifics, what happened is the Soviet authorities were kind of being forced to react to some of these events. And as they were forced to react to control and to co-opt some of these investigations to avoid recrimination, um, to, to emphasize things that, that this was bad policy or this was an accident or this was drought, what it ended up doing is exposing some of these figures who I just call, for lack of a better term, um, you know, Soviet Ukrainian stakeholders, especially in the fields of politics and academia, to um, the Holodomor as a systematic as a systematic event, as a narrative. So it wasn't just something that happened in my family. It wasn't just something that happened in my village or my region. But people began to be exposed that this was something that had happened much wider um, for the first time in their in their storytelling. And so um, just to mention a few things about what was happening in North America, um, in 1983 turned out to be what I think a very significant year for, for starting off this process with some things that happened in North America. This was the 50th um, anniversary of the Holodomor, so it prompted the Ukrainian diaspora in the United States to initiate this series of activities that were designed to promote awareness for something that was really unknown for broader American society at the time. Carolina showed us a great picture from some of those events. Um, and th this was targeting, though, US policymakers, it was targeting US congressional representatives and the broader public. And their activities culminate in a 1983 rally that had 18,000 people gather in front of the Soviet embassy. 
So relatedly, a resolution was passed in the US House and the US Senate the same year that commemorated what was then called the Ukrainian famine. This was again successful diaspora-led activism that included participation by the Americans for Human Rights in Ukraine and the Ukrainian Weekly Publication, and notably partnerships with American Jewish organizations. And there was this um, climate at the time that was um, complementing things. It was a sort of political climate favorable to exploring Soviet crimes under President U.S. Ronald Reagan. That's not a causal factor, but it did, did influence a sort of sentiment. And you can see that in um, the way that the U.S. Congress establishes the U.S. Commission, um, tasking the body with studying, quote, the famine in order to expand the world's knowledge and provide the American public with better understanding of the Soviet Soviet system by revealing the Soviet role in the famine. So as most of us know, I won't go that much into the commission. I think we, we talk about that a lot, but it was officially formed in 1985. It delivers its report to Congress three years later. It was so significant for capturing several thousand pages of oral history memories, especially given the advanced age of a lot of these um, members who were interviewed. And what I found really interesting as a comparative genocide scholar is that there is such explicit language in the commission of walking us through the 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. Um, there was uh, this explicit language that walks through the criteria there, that walks through it was met, um, how, how the events met it. And um, following the release of this commission, I was remiss to mention it, but of course it was led by James Mace. Um, most of us know who James Mace is. That's why I skip over this a little bit for this presentation, but it's in the paper. But following the release of this report, the US Congress enacted a resolution in 1990 that was also signed into law by President George H.W. Bush. And the resolution declares the first week of November as National Week to memorialize the famine victims and condemn, quote, policies of russification to suppress Ukrainian identity. This declaration and this holiday actually imply that the United States has been officially commemorating the Holodomor before the Ukraine was even a politically sovereign nation state, which is really interesting in that language about russification. Um, so um, James Mace is so important to the story. My discussant knows I actually devote a significant amount of the paper to discussing his role in the commission, um, his role for my interviewees in speaking Ukrainian um, and how important that was. Just because I know my audience, I think I'll skip over that, but I want to mention that it's certainly um, mentioned a lot in my paper. Um, and so I, I did want to mention um, I, I did want to mention before I move on from North America that I had the opportunity to speak with Professor Roman Serbin for this as well and to learn more about the conference from, from his retelling that was held in Canada in 1983 because certainly things were happening in Canada that were very significant as well. Um, and so he told me, quote, in 1983, just by chance, I organized with Professor Bogdan Kochinko of the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. Um, at, the time, where, at the time he was the head, we organized the first conference on what we called at the time the Ukrainian famine. And so this resulted in the, an edited volume in 1986, and it was linked to, at the time, what was becoming a scholarly push. So not just political activism, but also a scholarly push. And um, he also clarifies that, that they sort of reversed their opinion at the time, that it was, I'm not sure if it was a genocide as new archival material comes to light. And the primary discussion in this work of genocidal criteria comes in a chapter by Chalk and Johannesson, who are well-known genocide scholars. And they're urging at the time a move away from the political abuse of the term genocide. It's connected to why I chose those four stakeholder groups. So really, I think what they're arguing is more related to the tensions within genocide scholars than necessarily the Ukrainian case when I read that 1986 chapter. Um, and I want to mention, I want to be brief, but I want to mention too that, that what was happening there was causing a kind of reaction within the Soviet system um, in the retelling of the people I spoke with that, you know, they, they've talked about the role of, of these events potentially even being lost to trauma, um, but also that, that there was um, the necessity for the Soviet system to just acknowledge that all of this was happening there across the ocean. And so if I skip ahead, just skipping ahead in my paper a little bit, um, it did expose um, people to, as I said, this, this version of events as something that was 
not just fragmentary, but something that was becoming um, what, what it would ultimately be a narrative, like a, um, actors in it, somebody who did this, somebody who was impacted by it, people who were bystanding, a, a version of it where there were different roles and not just this amorphous suffering. Um, and so um, I did speak with um, one of the figures that I spoke with from academia was Professor Stanislav Kuczynski, who many of us know. And so it's very interesting to speak with him about this, um, to, to watch how his telling of it changes over the course of his career, to ask him about it and to use his own words. And so I'll just read a short excerpt because he gets it again, I think some of the, the tensions that were happening. So this is what he told me, that he had, he had worked here and is when I met him in the National Academy of Sciences, that he's worked here in this department since 1971. I'm quoting him now. We study the history of the 1920s and 30s. It was my function to study the Holodomor when the Mace Commission started to send their findings all around the world the Central Committee of the Ukrainian Communist Party was very worried and decided to organize the Anti-Famine Commission um, headed um, by, by people who are already dead. And due to my duty, I became a, a member of this commission. We were allowed to work in the archives we had not had access to before they were previously closed to scientists as well. I used to work on the problems of the proletariat, and here I first began studying the peasantry in 1987. I contacted James Mace. He was here in Kiev in 1990 and brought the layout of three volumes of memories for me to findings of his commissions. So, um, so he was explaining that. And then I also spoke with someone who at this time was his graduate student. I won't mention who right now, um, but I mentioned, I mentioned this to one of his graduate students during this period, and he had recounted that um, he had asked privately after a lecture about this famine, and he said, what famine? I don't know anything about it. And so you can just sort of tell that, that the um, Holodomor knowledge was emerging slowly, carefully, and discreetly during this period. Um, and you know, I, I do want to skip ahead. I'm mindful that I'm actually almost at 15 minutes. And so I think one of the things that, since I've talked about academism, um, activism, political activism, and academia, I'll just mention um, a little bit about my conversations about this with the first president of Ukraine, President Kravchuk. And um, let me just find where I am. Um, always important when you're quoting people. So I I asked him about this as well, and he is he's been in the public record um, before he died that that he played played a role in this. Um, I'm quoting from from public materials now in tw um, 2002. And he said, quote, in early 1980s, many publications became appearing in the Western press on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of one of the most horrific tragedies in the history of our people. A counter propaganda machine was put into motion and I was one of its wheels. And so when I spoke with him about this in 2018, um, he was confirming that, that he was allowed to study, that, that Gorbachev allowed the internal study of the Holodomor after trips abroad in 1986 and 87, saying, quote, I know from inside that they explain the reason for the famine by a drought, um, implying at the time really that, that there were questions about whether or not that was accurate. And he said, and they, the communist authorities, were asked, um, so why did you reject the foreign assistance offered from the Red Cross and other organizations? And there was no answer. And so in his retelling of this, he's portraying the decision of the Central Commission to publish a first official book on the Holodomor as a first step. Um, he said, it, the, although that its conclusions and estimates were far from the truth, and I'll just skip ahead a little bit, but he really emphasizes um, that he was very proud of, of the role of the monument at St. Michael's and that he received threats from them. He did a um, significant amount of, of justification about why he didn't have enough votes in the parliament for a genocide resolution, um, but he said he would have gone for it, in the, and again, in his retelling. And um, what I just found so interesting in this whole conversation, as I unfortunately have to wrap up, was that when people were doing the retelling of events, there was this emphasis on, we didn't know a lot, we didn't have access to the records that we do now, we've spent a long time reconstructing events, and then when I spoke with President Kravchuk, his response was actually the opposite. He was like, oh, we knew, it was all political, essentially this was the subtext of his conversation. Now again, the way that a person chooses to retell events requires its own analysis, but even what that's telling us about the mood in Ukraine in 2018, that he would feel, um, you know, either the need or the desire to kind of mentally reconstruct um, his role in the testimony of Holodomor was really interesting for me and showed me how that narrative had developed. So I want to um, hopefully leave room time for the discussant. I'm right at 16 minutes. Okay, so I do need to wrap up. But um, thank you so much, and um, it's really a pleasure to be with you all.
Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, John and Daria, for inviting me to be here uh, in first uh, three wonderful presentations. Uh, just to caveat my discussion and comments, I am not a historian, and neither do I study the Um, But I do study international relations, and I think all three of these panels really speak to some broader international relations and political science questions. So I'm really glad to be here, and I had a great time reading these papers and learning about something that I know about but didn't know uh, in such great detail until uh, the last 48 hours. Uh, I'm going to start with, I'm going to go in order. I have a lot of comments and I also told uh, the panelists that I have gone sentence by sentence and put comments throughout their papers, so I'll send them after. Uh, but I have three pages of handwritten notes for each of them. Uh, there are some overarching themes and I'll just kind of skim through those uh, because I know we are short on time and I would like the audience to ask uh, some questions as I imagine there's some wonderful ones. Uh, for all three papers, though, they are extremely rich in detail, um, especially the first or the first and the last in the empirical detail that is in there. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so many uh, diverse sources, many primary sources, and it was quite fun to read them and to read some of the block quotes that were uh, in there. Uh, Ray, in your paper, uh, there was so much data, there are so many findings, there are so many sources, there's so much happening there, uh, is incredibly well researched. Um, in the point, and actually when you're presenting, you had those four sections, and I, to be honest, I think it could be a book rather than a paper. I think that would be a nice setup for a book um, because there's just so much in here, uh, which I think um, together I think would be a really fascinating book and perhaps maybe or four papers. Um, but in, in whole, it helps us contextualize uh, the Holodomor in many different ways beyond the USSR and within that context, which is the point of the panel and the larger uh, conference that we're at. Uh, but I thought that it was really nichely set within Western Europe, um, as well as vis-a-vis -vis the US. And I thought that really spoke well to Christina's paper, as she talked about at the end. Uh, this showed us the significance of the wheat agreement and its attempt, or its failure, I suppose, uh, to prevent and or limit, however we want to look at, uh, the consequences of the famine. Um, all th again, all three of these papers are very well structured, written, and clear. Uh, in terms of points for improvement, um, I, as I mentioned before, for some of years, I'm a methodologist, so that was where my eye went to immediately. Um, I'm very, uh, I love looking at the methods, and that was something I felt was lacking a bit and just sort of tossed into the very long introduction. Uh, so I thought that was perhaps a point that you could unpack a bit further is to tell the reader, you know, what are these sources, where did you find them, and the, perhaps the number of the sources. And you did talk about how you analyze them, and you said critical discourse analysis, but I wasn't entirely convinced that's actually what you did, um, as I felt that you were pulling a different quotes. And so perhaps a more thorough or nuanced um, discourse analysis could be done, or even not at all. Um, and you did talk about how you use media sources, but I wasn't really clear on which particular sources um, always, and that might be uh, a separate methodology section, um, or just taking that out of the intro to make the intro a little bit shorter. This is if you are to keep it a paper and not a book. <laughs> um, I also thought it would be worthwhile to bring in North America a little bit more, as it was discussed in there, and you did kind of put those mentions in, but you didn't really explicitly unpack it, and that wasn't until a bit later in the paper, as you did focus predominantly on Western Europe, and so this is something either I thought uh, to be have a more of an emphasis on <clears> earlier. <throat> And um, I did put a, a note that it might be worthwhile to connect to some of the other papers um, that I imagine you discussed this morning, but specifically Christina's um, in her um, reference and kind of her analysis on the US perspective that could kind of, um, I guess, fill out some of what you briefly had mentioned. Um, this might be a historian thing, but I found that all three of the papers really relied on block quotes. Um, and in some ways, I thought that actually lengthened a paper unnecessarily. And maybe as a political scientist, we're taught to really show the reader what you're, you want in the quote. And sometimes I felt in all three of these papers that there's just so much text that by reading it, I wasn't even sure what was important. Uh, this is not to say that it's not rich empirical data because it is incredibly rich, but it might be worthwhile to either shorten the block quotes or direct the reader to what is important in the quotes by just adding a few sentences. And this is for all across all three papers. Uh, with this, I think you could all three um, put your voice in a little bit stronger to assert your own position. It was there, but with these block quotes, it really got lost. And I think that there might be more of a balance into having your voice uh, put into, or at least your own argument into that writing. Um, also, uh, you did mention, and I think all three have shown in different ways, the way that we could connect this to contemporary events. Well, they did a fantastic job doing that at the beginning, and I think that there might be a larger discussion about where we can do that and connect it to what we see right now um, in Ukraine. Um, I'm going to leave there and move on so we can keep going. 
Uh, Ole and yours was also extremely fascinating. Um, it was a shorter paper, but I thought that it really was a great start to a fantastic piece. I think there's so much there, and we saw that in the beginning of your presentation. I also thought that this could be something now that could be a book that we could see these contrasts or comparative analysis um, or drawing those trends as you've already seen between the Holodomor and also what we see right now in Ukraine. Um, one challenge or the one thing I was thinking about in reading your paper was I'm not sure that it was public opinion per se that you're speaking about, but more the role of the institutions. Um, and you kept bringing up um, the Red Cross and you also brought up the League of Nations. Um, in your paper, I felt that those analyses were a little bit too short and that really that's where you, sh you should really center the analysis on there and just make that the bulk of the paper. Um, and this might also be because in political science, political opinion mean, or public opinion means something a little bit different than what you talked about. But I think what you actually are talking about are the institutions and that role there. Um, also related to the institutions, uh, unpacking the significance of the Congress. You mentioned on one slide, um, there was the little known committees. And I think that in itself speaks to the role of the institutions and you really could put much more of an emphasis on that that I think would be some really important information uh, there that I don't expect historians have really analyzed up to this point. Um, uh, relatedly to what I mentioned with Ray is to insert your own voice a little bit stronger. Um, this kind of got lost sometimes in the quotes, which sometimes I wouldn't show if the quotes were yours or if they were empirical material. So sometimes it's just clarifying a little bit more, unpacking your claims and to assert your voice uh, more strongly in there. Um, all three papers, oh, this is another um, point, is to not always assume that the reader knows the um, significance. Again, this does probably, depending on the audience you're speaking to, um, sometimes it was assumed, um, for example, in Christina's paper, Mace didn't come up till page four, but that became the bulk of the paper. So some of these uh, terms or references might be worthwhile to introduce just a little bit sooner, um, depending again, of course, where you are hoping to submit the paper or the projects. Um, I'm going to just move on to Christina, though, because I know we're short on time. Uh, Christina is also extremely empirically rich. Um, as I mentioned before, there is so much in here. Um, again, I told you it could be a book, and I see why uh, it is going to be part of a larger project. Um, again, on the methodology point, it would be really interesting uh, to put more of an emphasis on that because the methodological contribution is so important but it really didn't come until the end and i think you actually mentioned in the last sentence it, this paper shows why oral histories are important or something but yet that could have been brought so much more uh, to the forefront because you had such rich empirical material I was still left asking though who some of these people were, um, and I know I mentioned to you before whether or not it's a young woman speaking or an older man, I think those are really important uh, details that you don't have to reveal the identity of the respondent uh, or the participant, but instead you can just contextualize it to, uh, to help the reader. Um, da, da, da. You have a really interesting point about legacies in the paper, and you also brought that up in your presentation, and I didn't really see that coming out as much in the paper, and I thought that was something that really you could do. Uh, in political science, there's a lot a larger literature that I could send you, because I think this is something that really could show um, how these legacies both at in, in Ukraine, but also within the diasporas. Uh, and related to that, you talked a lot about the diasporas, but you only really mentioned the US and then referenced Canada. Um, I mean, as someone who's from the Canadian diaspora, it would be interesting for you to unpack that a lot more and to, to just be more upfront if if and which ones you're talking about, because there is also a large, or there are large diaspora populations around the world, such as in Argentina, uh, that might also be worthwhile to explore um, as the populations there may or may not have had a similar response to what we saw in the US. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there and open it up for questions. Thank you. Your questions. Uh, can we take a few questions from the audience so they have time to prepare? Uh, this question is for Olya Natyuk. I, I don't want to belabor the point, but um, one of the things that's occurred to me is that um, that whole international campaign, which I think today we've seen how enormous it is, and, and you've actually even expanded the geographic boundaries of what I knew about the campaign. Um, it was treated by the people who led that campaign as a failure. 
I wonder if, and this is a philosophical question, I wonder if it was. I mean, we talk about the failure of the famine of 32, 33. The campaign starts in 33. There is no famine after that. That is, um, perhaps, you know, they, and as I say, it's a philosophical question. I'm not sure how methodologically we could get at an, at an answer, but perhaps, uh, you know, sort of tracing the Soviet, Soviet response would, would be uh, one way. But I wonder if it's not time to reevaluate um, what the success of that campaign was. A question to uh, Ray Ganesh. Um, the uh, recognition of the United States by, uh, well, the re recognition of the Soviet Union by the United States. Uh, what role did, uh, let's say, um, geopolitics have to play, specifically um, the United States' concern about Japan in the Far East? And um, that's that's to you, and then to uh, Christina Hook, and to follow up on the question that was posed by the um, um, regarding Canada. Um, having been at the um, unveiling of the monument to the Baltimore victims in 1983 in Edmonton, um, I mean that was a pretty pretty big event. So there were a lot of a lot of events taking place in Canada as well. Um, one of them being a scholarly event, the first scholarly conference on the Holdemore, which was held in Montreal in 1983. And then, of course, in addition to the Edmonton Monument, there was a monument that was being um, planned uh, for Winnipeg and which was erected, I think, a year later. So uh, there was uh, quite a bit going on in Canada as well. I just wanted to maybe make that point and uh, um, um, ask Christina, you know, are you going to have a Canadian mm -hmm. content uh, in your planned um, book as well? <laughs> Being a Canadian nationalist, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Just briefly to Christina. So I had the opportunity to speak to President Kravchuk a long time ago when I worked for the US Embassy in Kiev, and he's a storyteller, right? Mm -hmm. He's He spins a good yarn. So I, I'm wondering, uh, I was just looking up his biography briefly. He was born in 1934, mm -hmm. and he was born in Poland, mm -hmm. right? So I, I wonder, in a way, he's sort of, an, not entirely, but more so than other Ukrainians, an outsider to the question of Holodomor. So I wonder if that enabled his political maneuvering or if it skews his perspective, what's your thoughts on that? Thank you. If there are no more questions, we will go to panelists to answer the comments by the discussant and the audience, questions from the audience. So to your point uh, about uh, Japan's recognition of Manchu Ko, I, I think it was terribly important in shaping uh, U.S. policy in that region of the world. Uh, we had several agreements with, with China, and almost immediately after the recognition of Manchu Ko by Japan, uh, the U.S. Uh, tries to, to sell China or make available to China uh, millions of tons of, of, of grain. And so they, they, they didn't want to lose what influence they had there. Um, and, and, and it really uh, was a kind of fulcrum uh, in terms of how the negotiations about recognitions would ultimately go. And Fisher was one journalist who, who, who said that uh, the really, the Soviets held the stronger hand in, in, in even though they were being threatened, you know, by Japanese incursions, um, the fact that that really the US was was trying to back China at that time, and they, they were in, in dire uh, straits at, at that point. Um, 
you know, he actually said the U.S. needs recognition of the Soviet Union more than the Soviets do. So it, it was an important point in, in shaping U.S. policy. Yeah. So I'll address the questions. Thank you. Actually, the 1983 statue was so important to me that I have that what will be the opening chapter of the book. Um, so I might be able to mention reference in this. And I do talk about the 1983 conference in Montreal. It was very important. Um, it was just really that I wasn't speaking faster, that it didn't make it into the presentation today, but you're absolutely right. Um, I was also at 10,000 words for this, which felt a little hefty for my discussant. Um, but when I have the luxury of a book, I would like to expand that, um, especially the role that your institution has played. So, um, And then, yes, about the role of, of personalities um, and individual histories, Matt, um, about, about President Krabchuk as a storyteller. I do see that. And he also likes to tell stories about you know the bridge to Moscow, the television show, and um, speaking Ukrainian because they were told that Ukrainian and Russian were mutually um, intelligible, so I'll just speak Ukrainian, and he would feel very proud of that. Um, and so really, there, that's why I, throughout my larger work, and I do like to publish this as a book because it is complex, but I like to look at these groups of stakeholders as they influence each other, but also as they interact within their professional kind of mandates because it's very different. So for a contemporary example, if you look at um, the recent, the very recent U.S. recognition of the Armenian genocide, which involves current U.S. relationships with Turkey, you would expect to speak with politicians policymakers there who say things like, well, yes, even if it did happen, is this something that we should recognize officially if it might actually harm people now in present day um, Levant region? And so there are different kind of mandates and ethics. And in some of the larger quotes I use from President Krabchuk, he talks about, well, I just didn't have the votes for it. Um, and so, you know, that's again echoing that he was also operating within his professional mandate, his professional um, views of of the role, the instrumentalization of, of histories. Um, and yes, just the fact that, that these individuals have histories, our personalities influence each other. Um, I, in the larger work, I do a lot of social network analysis to see how they all interact with each other, how we can trace any, any potential influence that they had on each other in these times and over the course of their career, which is a big task. So thank you to both who asked me questions. Uh, I will uh, start with Olga uh, Andrievsky question. Uh, was it a failure, failure of this uh, action uh, or uh, trying to help people? And uh, uh, yes and no. And uh, uh, from uh, one point of view, it was a disaster. It was a catastrophe. Uh, from the point of dying people, uh, point of view of dying people. And uh, the other uh, point of view is just an ethical point of view, and it was a catastrophe. Uh, Olga Ippolit Boczkowski named it uh, as a spineless Europe. Uh, it, and it was a metaphor for uh, for uh, no uh, no protecting uh, dying people by uh, public opinion makers, by politicians, by institutions established to uh, to protect people and nations. So, from that point of view, it was a disaster. And it was a total failure. But from the other point of view, uh, uh, from the historical perspective, it wasn't a failure. First of all, it uh, uh, consolidated uh, different uh, poli political orientation, people of different political orientation from Ukrainian immigration. Uh, around the whole uh, the whole world, and it is one uh, point. Uh, another, it uh, put uh, Ukrainian question again on the stage of uh, of international forum. And uh, from today's point point of view, 
uh, we are witnessing uh, that now uh, um, not only government but also public opinion makers are acting totally different. So from that point of view, remembering about uh, Holodomor, remembering about uh, these efforts uh, made then, uh, I think it helped uh, in today's situation. And uh, answering a question uh, arose, uh, arose uh, by, uh, by Marnie, uh, I totally agree <laughs> this material, not, not just for one book, it is uh, for, as I mentioned, uh, it is, uh, it is a, um, for, for many, many researchers, for uh, uh, teams, or a team of researchers, maybe not not one team, and maybe more than one. So uh, um, I I I uh, I want to confess that I changed the title because uh, because uh, uh, I I was absolutely. Um, uh, uh, Unable to to do this, uh, just even uh, just uh, just to name the main directions. So I I name these directions uh, six directions, and then I I decided to focus only on one because it is impossible. And uh, one more uh, one more um, question about public opinion makers and uh, and. Uh, international organizations for sure they are public opinion makers uh, uh, because uh, because they uh, provide uh, attitudes statements and uh, it is one thing when I Ola Natyuk published something in the paper and uh, completely another when when Pope uh, Francisco uh, uh, just uh, tell some some one sentence, and it is uh, it is significant. So uh, about public opinion makers, it is uh, it is a good point, but uh, but we have to remember that uh, that such organizations and the head of, of, of such organizations are also public opinion makers, but. Um, when I uh, when I uh, just uh, uh, took a look uh, at uh, at um, uh, newspapers, uh, for example, French newspapers, they they were full of uh, of uh, information about uh, famine in Ukraine, and. Uh, uh, the, the the main uh, the main uh, French newspapers were full of, of it. Uh, then I moved to uh, Switzerland newspapers, uh, the same, uh, and uh, uh, finally I found uh, uh, two uh, two MA uh, theses. Uh, uh, Devoted to to Czech, uh, Czechoslovakian uh, uh, press, so uh, great. But I I don't uh, find any any uh, good uh, good uh, paper or ar uh, article about Polish uh, Polish uh, public opinion and Polish newspapers. Uh, for sure, uh, we have a brilliant publication uh, prepared by uh, by Jan Jacek Buski, my, uh, my uh, uh, distinguished colleague uh, from uh, Jagiellonian University. We have also other publications uh, uh, of Polish scholars uh, like Robert Kuśnierz, but no uh, one of them is uh, concerning uh, uh, Polish newspapers, and uh, they are—they uh, were also full of of, of uh, information. But at one point, uh, the information just were stopped, were pressed, and and it was a uh, um, 
um, uh, subject of uh, my other my other publication when it happened why uh, why it happened but uh, it is uh, it is other other story this uh, very similar publication uh, very similar situation is with great britain so not only uh, garrett jones uh, and Malcolm uh, Magritte, uh, much more, uh, much more uh, journalists uh, informed uh, British public opinion about uh, about Ukrainian famine, uh, famine in Ukraine. So uh, uh, every every subject could be uh, uh, could could be uh, a book, uh, not not just a paper. Thank you. Um, so we are running out of time, but I'm going to ask a question as well. There's so much here, and this is the space to do it. Uh, my question is for Christina. As a comparative genocide scholar who works, um, and, and I, I'm familiar with your work, so excuse me, I'm going to not talk about all the things that I need to here, but as, part, as, as someone else who's also studied the 1980s and worked with the commission files a lot, I'm wondering in your larger project in the monograph, um, if you get at other tensions that are happening in the 1980s that Holodomor advocacy is also responding to and working with, um, there are what Carolyn Dean has called moral witnesses, and it's in the 20th century and in the 1970s and the 1980s, and it's not just um, victims of the Holodomor that are trying to advocate for their causes. This happens against gulag survivors. Um, Emma Kubi writes about this in Political Survivors, which is an excellent book. Um, also, Holocaust survivors are advocating as well. And I'm wondering, um, with this kind of global contextualization that's happening, which speaks very well to our conference theme, um, if you address some of these other initiatives that are also going on, and how the whole of the more advocacy among the groups you're working with um, are also <laughs> working in confluence, or perhaps against these other uh, initiatives that are taking place in the 1970s, 1980s? Should I answer or is it okay? okay. So that is a fascinating and an excellent suggestion, John. I'm going to make sure that I think there's traces of that in my work, but I'm, I'd like to make that deeper um, because it is this process of groups often banding together. So I do go into my paper a little bit about some of the coalitions that emerge. I think we're also watching in real time a lot of kind of almost like strange bedfellers, as they say, like coalitions emerge for Ukraine right now. And I think that in this historical time period, we were watching that happen. Um, so making that richer, making that deeper. Um, there's probably also a connection there. You know, I don't like uh, explanations that just say, oh, it was a favorable political climate, it was the Reagan administration. I don't like saying that, but I do think that there is a thread worth tugging on that says what are the power dynamics of which cases ultimately emerge and rise to the level of congressional legislation and which don't. And so within that, that myriad of activities that you're so rightly describing, um, why the Holodomor um, goes up is, is probably going to have to do with that relationship, although not exclusively for it. So thank you. Yeah, power dynamics, coalitions. That's a great idea. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> we can talk more later. That's right. <laughs> um, so if we don't have any more questions, uh, I think that we can take a brief pause for just a minute. Uh, we have a keynote speaker that's supposed to start at 4, and we'll have some more information on that in just a sec. But um, I want to give all of our panelists a round of applause and our discussant, Marnie, for a great comments. Thank you, thank you Marnie. <laughs> Okay, um, we have time for coffee. Uh, we're going to push back our keynote about 30 minutes. So we'll have some coffee and then we'll be back here promptly by about 4.30. Thank you. <laughs>